Good afternoon and welcome to everyone to this panel devoted to the scramble for the Eastern Mediterranean. This virtual panel is uh, organized by ISPI uh, in the framework of a Rome Med Mediterranean Dialogues, the uh, long year initiative of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and uh, ISPI. This year marks the seventh edition of Rome Med Dialogues and the, uh, the, our uh, biggest event will be at the beginning of December, hopefully in, uh, uh, in Rome. I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished guests, our distinguished speakers, and uh, Nasser Altamimi, with welcome Nasser, who is a political economist, senior associate research fellow at ISP for the Mediterranean and Middle East Center. Mitat uh, Celik Pala, professor at Kadiraz uh, University in uh, Istanbul. Alessia Melcangi, Associate Research Fellow ISP and uh, Assistant Professor at the University uh, of Sapienza in Rome and also non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. How many affiliations? And uh, um, Gabriel Mitchell, Director of External Relations at the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policy in Jerusalem. Welcome, Gabriel. And last but not least, Zenon Sierras, researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Rio. So welcome to, to everyone. And we will focus on a, a very um, important topic uh, this afternoon. Over the last uh, years, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean has been uh, under the international uh, spotlight as uh, it turned uh, into a major hotspot for competition among regional players and not only regional players, several uh, international uh, actors uh, uh, are involved uh, and uh, operate in, uh, in the area. 
We talk about uh, competition uh, for uh, energy resources, uh, but also about geopolitical competition for uh, regional influence. As, uh, uh, that makes uh, this part of the Mediterranean a piece of a greater um, puzzle of the Middle East and uh, North Africa, of the MENA uh, region puzzle. More than 10 years ago, gas discoveries uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean were expected to foster a regional cooperation and to be a driver for uh, the solution of long-standing disputes and crises uh, that affect regional stability. However, while gas discovery was the catalyst of cooperation for some countries, it was on the other end uh, the reason of uh, uh, increasing tensions uh, among, uh, uh, among other, uh, other countries. Since the beginning uh, of 2021, after uh, um, an escalation of, um, of tensions that uh, reached its peak last summer, so uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, we have witnessed a uh, de-escalation in the area with uh, uh, resumptions of talks between uh, Greece and, uh, and Turkey several uh, attempts from the Turkish side uh, to, um, to detain, to uh, rapprochement with other uh, regional players. Against uh, this backdrop, uh, gas exploration and exploitation uh, activities are just one side of, uh, of the coin, just one side of, uh, of the issue. Uh, so, uh, we will try to understand with uh, our uh, speakers, with our experts, uh, what are uh, the interests and the, the, the agendas of uh, the countries uh, involved, of the regional countries. We will try uh, to analyze and to understand what are the implications implications of their moves or their, their policies. Uh, on the regional stability, on the regional uh, security context, a uh, security complex, uh, we, can, uh, we can say. And we will see which factors uh, could contribute uh, to overcome divergences and uh, uh, what room for uh, uh, a wider cooperation. I would like to start uh, uh, with uh, uh, Gabriel Mitchell, uh, trying to understand the Israeli uh, views, the Israeli perspective. Israel is uh, one of the, uh, of the major player, uh, players in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, the first country where gas uh, fields were discovered more than 10 years ago. So Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to ISPI for, for hosting this really important conversation. Um, obviously, you know, as you framed it, Israel was one of the first countries in which uh, offshore hydrocarbons were discovered in the 21st century. For most of Israel's history, Israel was effectively an energy island dependent on importing its fossil fuels from, at times, the far corners of the globe, in large part due to uh, its contentious relations uh, with its Arab neighbors and a long-standing Arab boycott, which at times extended to uh, much of uh, the commercial sector as well. So um, the discovery of offshore hydrocarbons was a transformative event within uh, Israeli domestic politics, within uh, Israeli energy policy, and certainly from the Israeli perspective is the kind of Touched a touchstone upon which many of the Eastern Mediterranean's greater geopolitical implications have uh, ha have flourished from. But I, I think that there are two other developments from the Israeli perspective that are of equal importance. Uh, the first is the very gradual U.S. Uh, withdrawal or, or the reduction of 
American uh, military uh, facilities in the region, uh, both in the Middle East and North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly, which has forced both Israel and some of the other actors in the region to kind of reassess their strategic needs um, and who are potential partners for cooperation. And certainly one of the traditional partners uh, that Israel for many years had a strong strategic relationship with was Turkey. But over the last 10 years, Israel's relationship with Turkey has soured. Uh, its set of strategic interests with Turkey uh, has diverged in a, in a number of uh, different ways. And so those two significant geopolitical uh, partners for Israel um, have, uh, have in, in essence, either uh, been replaced by a new set of actors and a new set of partners in the region, or are just diminished in their presence and their engagement and involvement um, in, in regional affairs. So those are the three core developments, energy discoveries, uh, the withdrawal of the United States, and um, the, uh, the fragmentation of the Israel-Turkey relationship that has really formulated and, and shaped Israel's thinking over the last 10 years. Um, and in essence, I think that Israel's goals in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean can be defined as such. First, to contribute to the establishment of a, a framework for regional integration and cooperation that addresses the commercial, commercial and geopolitical benefits of hydrocarbon exploration. And the most uh, visible example of that, of that is the formation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, um, upon which, uh, uh, to which Israel is a member. Um, in addition, in addition uh, is, Israel is seeking to uh, find multilateral solution, multilateral solutions to adapt to the U.S. withdrawal from the region. Sorry, give me one second. My apologies. Um, to find multilateral solutions to adapt to the U.S. withdrawal to the region uh, in coordination with its regional partners and allies to establish a, a norms-based framework for to deal with maritime issues in the region, to tackle climate change uh, that is increasingly affecting the Eastern Sorry Mediterranean. Sorry to interrupt you, Gabriel. If you want, we can uh, yes, come please. to Ciaras uh, and then we will back to you. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to you. So, Ciaras, uh, Greece and Cyprus, uh, first Cy Cyprus, the second area. Taking it into um, you know crucial and interests um, in the in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and I should add that Cyprus is a very you know a very uh, which uh, led them to um, according to many uh, scholars of American hegemony from the Middle East and the Eastern Medi Mediterranean had important effects about regional um, Turkey in conjunction with obviously domestic factors as well for reasons based on cooperation on multi-level cooperation between it or to let's say uh, and so on and that's why we ended up having the eastern mediterranean gas for let's say an agenda setting role nato relations are deteriorating and with international companies energy com problem which is turkey but also acquire some leverage there is this understanding that that for regionalism in the south uh, as a way and, and competition um, but the way to do that is a big question. Thank you, Mayor, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So as uh, the result of uh, uh, the ocean in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Hey, Valeria, it's known as many times in different can in the Eastern Mediterranean. There are reasons Ankara is excluded. Ankara is excluded uh, from all energy projects and security settings, geological and geopolitical matters uh, in Turkey's environment and the policy very currently in this region. Uh, as Zenonas mentions issues, but I may say among the, uh, the, un uh, the unresolved nature of science also became a kind of a significant Greek relations in the East Med, the Arab Spring, Greece and Egypt has had a significant potential client rather than a transit state or, or, or for Ankara, for example, Turkish sovereign rights is lively and very effectively. And this is a more complex region as well. Therefore, in the jurisdiction, uh, including maritime claims around its mainland, 
Uh, also, in the trigger of Turkey's recent deposits, it's more about a wider security thinking and the fear of being under attack or this and France. And uh, they are too proactive or assertive to counter such an attempt. This creates a region of vital importance for Turkey. See Russia as a partner country to Turkey, not only of them are interconnected to each other. And what is in the same and sources? Therefore, what we need is to normalize the region. And this is the setup that affects not only... Uh, Mitat, for uh, your uh, uh, clear and in-depth analysis of... To Gabriel Mitchell uh, for... Uh... I highlighted, I highlighted the importance from an Israeli concert with American leadership, um, but other, uh, other regional actors as well. In, in that regards, um, there are ongoing uh, negotiations between the monitoring of maritime traffic, uh, both on the maritime environment and, it, and in general, um, and climate change and, and creating mechanisms and perhaps a way for actors in the region to cooperate with one another. And certainly what we've seen over the last year since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic is a concerted effort on the part of Israel's Ministry of Energy to uh, reset its uh, renewable uh, agenda, align it much closer to the European Green Deal, and start to think creatively about what kind of multilateral steps can be taken in order to uh, co combat climate change. Um, finally, two other things that I think are critically important to Israel's strategy is to manage its relationship with Turkey. It, Turkey remains an important economic partner for Israel. Israel recognizes Turkey's uh, strategic uh, position in the region. Um, and while the current dialogue between Israel and Turkey is not particularly constructive, um, Israel, I think, has gone out of its way to ensure that there's a, a, a window open for a normalization of relations with Turkey if and when Turkey is ready to have that conversation. And of course, relations may not return to the way they were in the 1990s, let's say, but Israel is leaving that door open while at the same time fostering and developing a new set of relationships with other actors in the region, including Greece and Cyprus and Egypt, and of course, uh, its uh, new normalization partners in the Gulf states. And that is a real segue to, I think, one of Israel's uh, primary goals in the Eastern Mediterranean, because the regional space is overlapping with a lot of other regional architectures. And I think that for Israel, one of the uh, key goals is to essentially bridge the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean into other regional spaces where Israel already has a large set of interests. So projects that can bridge the Eastern Mediterranean to Europe, such as the Euro-Asia Interconnector, uh, which will effectively connect Israel's uh, electrical grid to that of Europe's, um, is a, a project that Israel sees as a way to take the, the developments of the Eastern Mediterranean and bridge them with its interests in Europe. And similarly, take those interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and bridge them to its new partners in the Gulf uh, and, and in Africa as well. So Israel sees, I think, the Eastern Mediterranean as a, as a, as a hub of uh, diplomatic activity, um, but it does not, it would not want to limit the potential of the Eastern Mediterranean within the boundaries of that regional space. It's constantly seeking and looking for partners, whether it be France, whether it be Italy, uh, and whether it be other actors um, outside of this regional space to take part in regional pro pro uh, projects and to find find areas for cooperation. I wanna add just kind of a, a, a final note because it, it ties into something that uh, Mitat had, had mentioned, and that's the, the question of you know, engagement with Turkey. And I think that for Israel, it's, it's been a, a, a vexing issue of how to maintain some kind of a, of a dialogue with Turkey while understanding the fact that at least for the foreseeable future, Turkey's strategic interests and power projected in, in the region may not uh, coalesce with Israel's interests, nor the interests of Israel's regional partners. And I think that one of the one of the key examples and something that's often overlooked is that when Israel and Turkey normalized relations 
first in 2016, energy was at the very least at a discursive level, a central part of that normalization package that there would be negotiations about the prospects of energy cooperation. And until uh, as late as 2018, Israel and Turkey were engaged in negotiations about the prospect of energy cooperation. And those negotiations fell through over price. So I think that while we can talk about, um, you know, uh, parties in the region not being interested in cooperating with Turkey. And I understand the fact that, you know, different actors may have a different set of interests and calculus and, and when, they're, when they're addressing Turkey. But I do think that on the one hand, it's easy to kind of package everything and frame everything as it currently exists today. But this region has been rapidly evolving over the last decade. And I, I don't think that it does anyone a, any, any, uh, any benefit to kind of narrowly identify everything as, as one way. Things are changing and they could change again in the months and in the years to come. Thank you, thank you very much, Gabi. You raised a lot of uh, interesting points. So the Eastern Mediterranean as a bridge uh, connecting uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia. And, uh, uh, but I would like to, to ask you a question uh, uh, related to uh, what you said, uh, how to engage uh, Turkey uh, with Turkey, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the one of the main uh, issue. And do you see any possibility to include Turkey in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, in uh, the short, medium term? It, in the short term, the answer is no. But the, the reason is based on uh, the experience of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum just a few months ago, all it takes is one country to veto a proposed uh, new member in order for that vote to fall. So um, in the case of the, the EMGF just you know a few weeks ago, um, the Palestinian Authority vetoed the uh, entry of the UAE as an observer, right? So even if Israel was on board with the idea of Turkey joining the EMGF, you would need a consensus across the, for uh, the forum's many members, each of whom have their own uh, disputes with Turkey to, to be on board. But I do think that there's opportunity for cooperation. And I think that the first way to start is to essentially change the dynamics of the conversation away from hydrocarbons, most of which have already been, uh, you know, allocated and contracts have been signed, um, but really to be talking about climate change. Over the last couple of weeks, we've all seen the images of mucilage developments around the Sea of, uh, sea of Marmara. Uh, Turkey is not alone in the eastern Mediterranean to experience the effects of climate change and uh, and I think that that might be a way of having a constructive dialogue about common issues um, and perhaps using that as a springboard for uh, further conversations about other uh, issues pertaining to uh, uh, maritime boundaries and perhaps energy cooperation. Thanks, Gabby. Very interesting. So climate change co could be a, a sector for, for future cooperation. And, uh, we, but we will back uh, on, on this uh, as I would like to have the opinion of uh, the other panelists. So, but now uh, turn to, to Egypt, another important uh, player uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the area. And, uh, but I would like to ask you, um, Alessia, how uh, to engage with Turkey. But uh, first of all, uh, but we will back on this uh, later on, but first of all, uh, what are the main drivers of uh, Egypt's uh, policy in, uh, in the region, above all after the discoveries of a uh, uh, gas field, of the uh, biggest gas field in the Eastern Mediterranean in 2015 of the coast of, uh, of Egypt? So over to you, Alessia. 
Thank you, Valeria, and uh, good afternoon to all. I'm uh, delighted to be among these uh, distinguished experts to discuss uh, about the current uh, Eastern Mediterranean geopolitics, uh, geopolitical context. Um, let me also thank CISP for organizing uh, such an important uh, event. Uh, to address directly uh, your question about uh, Egyptian interest in the Eastern Mediterranean, the main drivers of uh, its uh, politics. Uh, Egypt is uh, currently committed to relaunch the country's image among regional competitors in order to recap its historical role as a strategic pivot in the Mediterranean. Um, centrally, in this context, the Eastern Mediterranean represents a line of strategic intervention uh, due to the relevance of the basin as the new hotspot for the global energy market and new uh, arena for regional actors, geopolitical competition, as you stated before. Of course, Egypt has an uh, important interest connected with the energy sector. Uh, the country ob obtained uh, a great success in the beginning of 2019, uh, when President al-Sisi officially declared uh, the achievement of the country's natural gas self-sufficiency, thanks to the increased production of the Zor and Nur offshore gas field, thus covering the internal need. Uh, achieving natural gas, uh, gas self-sufficiency and the ramping up production and distribution of uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, thanks to the launch of Idco and Damietta liquefaction plants, uh, align perfectly uh, with Cairo's economic priority. First of all, manage its natural gas resources in the most effective way to serve its domestic energy needs. And this will require maintaining the momentum of exploration and development in order to compensate for the depletion of existing fields and to accommodate rising demand. And second, garner revenue from exporting any surplus gas that it can produce, becoming a regional provider for energy trade. Uh, the interest in uh, leveraging uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas reserves led Egypt to bet on increased cooperation between Greece, Cyprus, Israel, which won Cairo signed bilateral deals for the delivery of gas to the liquefaction facilities in the country. Uh, this grouping culminated, uh, uh, as stated before, in the creation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, in January 2019, uh, a platform aimed at developing a regional gas market, starting by taking advantage of the existing uh, uh, liquefied natural gas infrastructure in Egypt and supporting the construction of the uh, subsea East Med gas pipeline to Italy. At least uh, the deal with Greece uh, in economic energy fields and on areas of security. Uh, President Al Sisi last March confirmed an agreement signed on August 2020 with the Athens government regarding the designation of the exclusive economic zone that impinges on a zone part of the Turkey and the then Libyan government national accord deal. Uh, all these moves um, uh, confirm the will of these countries to strengthen a broader alliance, to relaunch their position in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also to counter Turkish assertiveness for gaining control of a large part of the basin. Uh, Israel and Egypt had a tradition of uh, acrimonious relation with Turkey. Uh, while the gas forms anti turkish land has also attracted the Emirates, which are engaged in an acute regional rivalry with Turkey. Uh, like Egypt, the Emirates takes issue with Turkey's support for Muslim Brotherhood movement across the region. Uh, thus, uh, all the Cairo attempts to announce its influence in the Eastern Mediterranean further exacerbated the dispute with Ankara. As we will know, Ankara reacted to this block by taking the field in the Libyan crisis, which represents a strategic geopolitical node for Egypt. Uh, in fact, besides uh, energy interests, there are the geopolitical ones. Egypt uh, focused on the energy factor as a tool for its geopolitical ambitions and for protecting its interests in the Mediterranean, such as in Libya. Uh, the tension between Ankara and Cairo have spilled over into the Libyan crisis after the Ankara's signature of a memorandum of understanding uh, uh, with Tripoli along the maritime demarcation border, uh, they do, would allow Turkey to drill energy resources in Cyprus and Greek offshore. Uh, this agreement can be read as a Turkish strategy to reshape its position in the Mediterranean energy dispute, of course, and the Turkish presence in this fundamental area was always perceived by Al-Sisi as an alarming threat. 
the long-standing conflict within the Sun Sunni world that sees Turkey and Qatar support soft political Islam against Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt was transferred into the Libyan front. It is evident that Egypt can hardly accept a Turkish-friendly Islamist government in Libya that controlled the Libyan Egyptian border because Cairo needs to safeguard its force Western frontier border in Syria and prevent dangerous uh, jihadist penetration from Eastern Libya. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, of course, we, uh, recently we are witnessing to a, a possible reconfiguration of uh, geopolitical dynamics in the basin uh, as a consequence of the uh, current restoration of diplomatic ties among rival regional actors, uh, such as the current attempt to rapprochement between Egypt and Turkey. Uh, but also uh, Turkey recent diplomatic initiative to settle outstanding dispute with Israel and the uh, Saudi Emirates bloc. Uh, if all these initiatives will develop with positive outcomes, uh, they would have direct consequence on the Eastern Mediterranean context. Uh, context. Uh, of course, that remains uh, to be seen in the next month. Thank you, thank you, uh, Alessia, for your uh, very clear uh, analysis and presentation. And there is a, a question uh, uh, relating to this uh, possibility to um, normalize uh, uh, relations between Turkey and, uh, and uh, Egypt. Uh, a, a question from uh, our audience. Fl following the recent political oh. consultations in Cairo, what should we expect in terms of bilateral uh, reconciliation uh, between uh, Ankara and, uh, and Cairo? Um, the, the, the last uh, bilateral consultation that uh, 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 take place, uh, took place in, uh, in Cairo, uh, I think were really important in order to state uh, some areas of cooperation. So first of all, Libya, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the possibility to achieve a stabilization in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. And these are, of course, the two main areas of cooperation and the most important element also for uh, Cairo and uh, for, uh, for Turkey. I think that uh, um, the, the relevance of uh, this uh, rapprochement between these two countries could have a consequence, uh, not only, of course, in Libya, uh, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean and the maritime border between these two countries. Uh, that uh, uh, a possible deal uh, on this regard could be a represent a priority and could become a starting point for talks between both sides. Uh, Turkey and Egypt uh, may negotiate the demarcation of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean borders uh, if the relation allows such a step. Uh, of course, our approach with Egypt would uh, go a long way to ending the isolation of Ankara, an issue related to the Eastern Mediterranean, but at the same time, a reduction in tension will create a better environment for Egypt to make progress with its effort to sustain its own natural gas surplus, uh, and of course, uh, to control the situation in, uh, in Libya. So focusing its effort on the resolution of other very risky questions, of course, the Libya, but also the joint dispute with Ethiopia, or uh, uh, to control, to stabilize an uncertain economic situation. And I think also that, uh, of course, on the other side, that the announcement of the restart of diplomatic talk between Egypt and Turkey provoked uh, different consequences in the other uh, regional actors, for example, in Greek. In, um, in Greek. Uh, the Greek government, uh, first, that any agreement on a direct maritime border between the two countries will support the Turkish narrative uh, on maritime rights in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, anyway, the current condition for an Ankara and Cairo appeasement uh, uh, make an agreement uh, unlikely. Although, if acting in tandem, Ankara and Ankara could ease the achievement of, uh, first of all, a political solution in Libya and a general appeasement in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, area. Um, I think that it is possible to think about uh, the creation of a sort of snowball effect, effect that could involve a general appeasement in the Eastern Mediterranean area, especially look at the uh, current uh, uh, situation. Thank you very much, uh, Alessia. And now we turn to 
another part of, uh, of the Middle East uh, to the Gulf uh, states, the Gulf monarchies, uh, especially United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, which was mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, Gulf monarchies that uh, have been very active uh, in uh, the wider Mediterranean, in the MENA region, above all after uh, the Arab uh, uprisings uh, in uh, 2011. So, um, what are the interest of these states that are not uh, Mediterranean states, uh, uh, stricto sensu, but uh, have a role, uh, have played a, uh, a greater and greater role uh, in, uh, in, in the region and also in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. I, tu uh, this, uh, I turn this question to Nasser Al-Tamimi. Please, Nasser, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Valeria. And thank you for the invitation and uh, to include me even in this great panel and the great presentation. <coughs> the Gulf is <coughs> representing another angle. You know, the, we talk, uh, everyone is, you know, talk about the maritime borders and uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, reserve in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, but the, <coughs> the Gulf state represent another uh, another issues uh, and their their involvement in the area is related to geopolitics, uh, not to maritime, uh, because it's distance region from them. And it, it could be traced to the Arab uh, Spring. And, uh, uh, if, and we, we, we talk about Gulf state, as you mentioned, the uh, Ferris is United Arab Emirates, uh, second Saudi Arabia, and then uh, uh, the uh, Qatar. Uh, these three countries, they have uh, ambitious <coughs> Uh, regional uh, foreign policy, and they are deploying uh, 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 their re uh, financial and economic resources to back this uh, uh, ambition. Uh, when we look back 10 years ago, uh, 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 after the Arab Spring, we could see that the, the Gulf region is split in two camps. Uh, one camp is including Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates, the other camp is uh, uh, Qatar, which aligned itself with uh, uh, to uh, with, with Turkey, and from there uh, we see uh, uh, evolving involvement from the Gulf state in the eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean. That time, from that time, you know, uh, these uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates. They look at the region from geopolitics. First, they see that the Arab Spring is uh, creating a lot of chaos. Can you hear me? Uh, OK, uh, thank you. And uh, creating a lot of chaos for these countries, especially Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates. They were frightened that the, the Iranian will, uh, 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 from their perspective, that the Iranian will uh, exploit that chaos and expand their uh, uh, influence in the region. The second uh, security uh, uh, threat perceived from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, United Arab Emirates was the idyllic, uh, the, uh, the so-called you know, uh, political Islam, or mainly the Muslim Brotherhood, that they are a security threat and the, if what's happening in at that time in Egypt and Tunisia and it could spread in the Gulf and uh, it, it create a new dynamic or it could double the regime or uh, 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 during the, the the early years of the Arab Spring and the third uh, the third uh, you know security threat from their perspective I, I'm talking about uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, United Arab Emirates and my colleagues already mentioned it. The American dis disengagement in the region, you know, you will see that in 2011, the American, they uh, scaled down their involvement in Iraq. Uh, uh, and the, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, which is, was ringing uh, strongly in the Gulf when Obama's the, uh, calling publicly for uh, Hosni Mubarak to step down. And uh, from that, you know, that, that development shaped the... Uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, 
United Arab Emirates, uh, their involvement in the region. From the Qatari side, <clears throat> this is, was very interesting as a result of the Arab Spring, is that the alignment or the, uh, 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 the converge of interest between uh, Qatar and, uh, and Turkey, and that relation was uh, uh, developing uh, uh, during the last de de uh, decade, and still, you know, as far as they uh, entered, converge or, uh, or aligned uh, together, it, it will uh, continue. <clears throat> So uh, we, in that context, you know, the Iranian threat uh, and also the third one, sorry, uh, the, they perceive the, uh, uh, also the Turkish rising influence. You know, they, the, the, they see the Turkish model uh, uh, aligning with political Islam and do, with the election and all of that. So they see that uh, as a political threat for them. For, uh, these all elements push them to be very active in the region. We see in Saudi Arabia, they lead the Gulf state in, in Syria, supporting the Syrian uh, rebels, because in that time they thought that if they double asset, uh, uh, they will stop the Iranian uh, uh, advancing to the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the other uh, the, the, the other issue is Turkey, and uh, uh, we see their uh, 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 position toward Turkey harding all, all over the time, uh, especially after the Turkey sided with Turkey with uh, Qatar in 2007, and uh, later on, you know, the, uh, we could include the economic side which is uh, especially the United Arab Emirates, uh, they have, you know, if, if, if you see the, uh, 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 the, these three uh, Gulf actors, I could say the United Arab Emirates is the most ambitious uh, uh, player because they have a broader agenda, geopolitical agenda, and uh, even economic agenda. Uh, and the, uh, their involvement also was... Uh, evolving regarding to regional development and uh, uh, international development, especially in the United States. We've seen them in Libya, very active, supporting General Haftar. Uh, we've seen them in uh, Libya uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia, supporting the uh, uh, Sisi regime, you know, from their side to, to keep uh, and uh, make Turkey as a uh, or uh, not using, uh, sorry, uh, or uh, look at the, uh, Egypt as a counterbalance uh, for Turkey in the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, and then, you know, in, in the last couple of, in the last few years, uh, there is a lot of reassessment in their, in, in their policy. Uh, uh, they see in the American, they are changing uh, administration. They, uh, they see a lot of, uh, you know, things happening in the uh, Mediterranean. So we see the United Arab Emirates uh, and also the pandemic uh, uh, give them uh, like covered uh, or uh, excuse to, uh, uh, from their perspective, to pursue uh, political relation with, with Israel. Uh, uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, Gulf state, I would say the United Arab Emirates is the more most active uh, uh, player in that region. Uh, they are interested in the hydro hydrocarbon projects in the region. They are interested in, uh, in uh, 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 economic development, economic trade, uh, and also uh, <coughs> the way I, 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 I see the United Arab, Arab uh, Emirates, they took step further than Saudi Arabia and, the, uh, and uh, uh, Qatar established their relation with, uh, with Israel. And the, from U United Arab Emirates perspective, uh, they have many issues related to, uh, you know, to the eastern uh, uh, side, uh, eastern Mediterranean, and issue also related to America and their domestic uh, diversification, diversification program. Because they think that Israel will, you know, will, will be a good trade partner, uh, will help them and, uh, you know, expand their diversification program from tourism and uh, 
uh, real estate to a technology and uh, and we see the United Arab Emirates their sovereign fund is very active in this kind of uh, new technology and uh, artificial uh, this is that you know to, to sum it up uh, there is start with geopolitics uh, and for you know to keep the status quo and the uh, and keep them uh, the uh, uh, political Islam from power in the uh, Arab Eastern. Uh, the second is uh, uh, they expanding their pol political diplomatic relation with uh, Greece and uh, and uh, uh, Cyprus and uh, if you see Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates, their pol political position uh, aligned with the, the Greece and uh, the uh, uh, Cyprus uh, in supporting them against uh, uh, Turkey. <clears throat> I think that's uh, the main issue. And thank, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nasser, for uh, your very in-depth uh, intervention. You you mentioned the, the United States uh, and uh, um, the new Biden administration uh, as a inaugurated a, a different uh, foreign policy uh, but uh, towards the Middle East there are uh, elements of uh, discontinuity and uh, elements of, of continuity and the, the question is uh, from uh, the Gulf perspective what changes uh, can we expect uh, in uh, the US posture uh, in, uh, in the region uh, towards the, the region? <coughs> I, I think uh, the American uh, position uh, how, uh, have a, a big impact in the Gulf state, uh, especially Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, if you see the four years before, the Trump administration, his uh, core policy, or it depends on three countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, and uh, Israel. And uh, he disengaged in most of the uh, uh, area. And that's was incentive for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to escalate their involvement in, in, in Yemen and Libya and in, in, even in the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, and uh, uh, develop a, a strong relation with uh, Greece and uh, the change of uh, of the administration. I think it will cool down the the relation with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, they will have a lot of issues with the United Arab Emirates regarding China, uh, human rights issues, and and not just the only the United States, also their policy in the region faces a lot of setbacks. You know, in Libya, uh, the involvement of uh, Turkey changing the balance uh, in, in, in Egypt, uh, the Egyptian government, they have their own interest and their own uh, you know, uh, agenda regarding Libya and, and and some of it is collided with with the uh, uh, the United with the uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, so in my opinion I don't think the fundamental issues or the disagreement among uh, uh, Gulf state <clears throat> especially with Qatar with the Sabir it will be there but I I, I would say it is <clears throat> a truce or this uh, this. Uh, you know the, this escalation of the, but the main issues is still there, and the, uh, the conflict could uh, flare up any time in the in the future, changing of uh, the uh, regional development or changing of the uh, uh, U.S. administration, uh, or many uh, uh, domestic issues inside Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates. Thank you, thank you, uh, Nasser. And I see that uh, many questions from the audience uh, arrived. So I will open the, the, the Q&A now, and uh, oh, I hope that we will have time to, to answer all, uh, all questions. We have a question from Dina, Dina Facuzza uh, for uh, Zenonas about the um, architecture you mentioned in uh, your intervention and what kind of parallel architecture away from traditional antagonism could be established and what are in your view uh, its uh, main components? 
Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very good question. Probably the one million dollar question. Um, but I, I'm going back to what Gabby said before, um, because I, th I think I think we need to to think outside the box, um, acknowledging that, um, as uh, as Nasser probably mentioned, um, that the, these new issues of of uh, hydrocarbons and energy resources are not standalone issues. They are connected to sovereignty and geopolitical traditional problems. So. Uh, those who who believed uh, maybe 10 years ago that these major problems would would be solved through energy were very wrong um and actually what energy has managed to do is exacerbate these problems so we need to move away from that line of thinking and find new new ways of of transcending perhaps issues that concern everyone and and as gabby mentioned um uh and the environment climate change uh renewable uh energy and and all that stuff which is uh, to everyone's concern is is very is, is the future uh, could potentially under conditions become the platform for um some kind of cooperation but this doesn't eliminate the fact that we still have problems to overcome how, for example, would uh, Israel and Lebanon um, find themselves in the same international forum? How would Turkey and Cyprus do that? Um, how, um, I, I don't know, how would Greece allow Turkey to participate in such a parallel structure? Because that's what, what I was referring to. Um, and um, the only thing I can think of is, is that we need to have more dialogue. And perhaps we need to come to some sort of a of a minimum agreement on on issues that we need to discuss without letting that spilling over into um, into traditional fears and concerns, either when it comes to threats or uh, when it comes to issues of um, recognition. That we need to to take all that uh, geopolitical and legal even load off. Uh, these discussions and try to to work our way up from somewhere that is, you know, a common concern. I know I am very well aware that this sounds idealistic and romantic, but um, um, perhaps uh, we need we need to start thinking like that if we're to unlock uh, the prospects of the region, because otherwise we're just locked to what has been there for the past 50 years. And that, that cannot be the solution. Thanks, uh, Zenona. Very, very clear. So we need to look for uh, common denominators uh, and to change uh, a narrative and uh, open uh, a window for uh, dialogues. Uh, turning to, to Turkey, there are uh, a couple of questions uh, uh, about Turkey. The first one is uh, why Turkey's activity in the Eastern Mediterranean is uh, usually labelled uh, as a warring neo-Ottomanism, while the same attitude from other stakeholders uh, in the area are generally seen as uh, simply action to pursue their strate strategic vision. Mitat, would you like to, to answer this yeah. question? Yes, Valeria. In fact, uh, I feel like a Russian academic, you know, uh, most probably when we are discussing Eastern Mediterranean or, or, or Black Sea related security issues or the Caucasus related, uh, Russia bashing is, is a, I don't know, a kind of a, uh, attitude. And now Eastern Mediterranean related issues or the Black Sea related issues, Turkey emerges as a other. Uh, of course, this is a presentation on Turkey's attitude as a person or academic. I'm also very critical of some attitudes of the current government in Turkey and by saying that this neo-Ottomanism or other kind of an expansionist labels on Turkish foreign policy are, I don't know, they are not realistic. They are a kind of an imagination. Of course, you can easily find some 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 groups or people within Turkey itself who, who are supporting such a kind of an idea. But, you know, this was over. Uh, now, Turkey has to face with the realities of its region, 
uh, and the realities of, uh, of the, the global politics as well. This is related with capacity and capability. You know, oh, do you have any resources? Do you have any interest? And is it sustainable to follow such a kind of a policy? Therefore, assertive and aggressive policies are acceptable for Turkey itself unless they are serving the interest of all those neighboring countries. Now we are discussing Turkey in different regions, from the Eastern Mediterranean to Caucasus, from the Black Sea region to the Middle East. And you see active Turkey dealing with its own issues, from terror to balance the other topics. Therefore, domestic issues are, are also prevailing around in Turkey, and in Turkey emerges whether it's a reliable and, and loyal actor in its Western uh, links and relations is an important thing. And uh, why we have such a kind of a labels? Of course, part of the blame is on Turkey, especially the current government since 2006, seven follow such a kind of a policy, uh, a kind of a zero problems with its neighbors. But the, at the end, we have many issues with our neighbors from Greece to Syria, from Iraq to Israel, from Egypt to, uh, to, to let me say, uh, Bulgaria as well. And these are the issues that we have to face with in Turkey. Okay. But what makes Turkey unique in those issues, uh, we are not, uh, or Turkey is not Russia, therefore there is a kind of a vivid and, and very lively discussion and opposition within Turkey itself to change Turkey's track. But how to resolve those issues? It is not only Turkey's capacity to offer such a kind of a resolution all those issues. Uh, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we have NATO summit and Turkey was one of the signatories of this NATO summit meeting and actively participated any kind of activities. You see, for example, Turkey as an active contributor to, to, to Black Sea uh, dry, drills or, or ex, ex, exercises. And then in the Eastern Mediterranean, I, I agree with my colleagues, we need a kind of a sea change in, 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 in fact, with the participation of all those governments. As I mentioned, Turkey and Egypt. And then as Gabriel mentioned, many people supporting Turkey's change and the priorities over uh, Israel and Egypt. And I don't know whether it's under those current circumstances, whether Turkey has managed to change its policy priorities, but you know, the price is getting higher and higher in day, in day by day. And it seems that Turkey or Turkish policy makers or decision makers need, are in need of changing their attitude and, and they, of course, narrative. Therefore, this narrative of neo-Ottomanist Turkey is, 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 is destructive, not only for Turkey and for the, the, the other regional actors, but Turkey's relations with the others as well. Therefore, we need to create such a kind of a, a new narrative to, to move forward. Uh, we need to see much more Western actors. And there are clues, in fact. Turkish-Greek talks is going on. Turkish-Egyptian talks are going on. Most probably Turkish-Israeli connections and talk are going on. And at the end, most probably in a dynamic environment, we may end up with a new policy and new uh, worldview, but it depends also Turkey's domestic politics as well. Thank you, Mitaka, Mitata. Uh, remaining on, uh, on Turkey, two, two quick questions. Uh, why did Turkey's uh, blue homeland maritime doctrine become so popular among the policy elite, military leaders uh, and uh, ordinary people? This is the first question. And then uh, an evaluation from your side. Do you think that uh, um, the assertive pol foreign policy in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean has been uh, effective for, from uh, your perspective? Uh, let's start with this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am on. Uh, let me start with this uh, bl uh, blue uh, homeland. It's, a, it's defined and considered by many other players, especially uh, by rivals, as I said. But, you know, for the uh, Turkish policymakers, as I mentioned in my presentation, the threat perception is prevailing. Uh, there is a kind of a threat perception. I'm not supportive of this, this uh, aura and understanding, uh, but the first component is about the fear of being under attack or being circled by the outside powers. And 
The second component is about regional ambitions of Turkey. And this blue homeland policy serves those ambitions and uh, funnels, of course, uh, uh, the, the threat perception as well. Uh, and the, the, the inventors of this policy, in fact, they are not popular as a person in Turkish policy or, or daily politics, but their suggestion served, in fact, uh, for the for the future perspective. It's a kind of an illuminated roadmap, in fact. Uh, it defines Turkey's axis of geopolitical zones of influence and defense. And therefore, the threat perception helped the others to use, especially the government, to use this term to bring all the opposition all together as well under those circumstances. And this ISMAT Energy Forum, this was a threat for the others. And this is the reason why we are discussing uh, the, the, the balance to balance the others within the region. Uh, and if Turkey considers that the Developing Energy Alliance in this Mediterranean has threatened the, uh, to append the, its Turkey's energy policy, the primary goal has been to maintain Turkey's position as an energy hub between the east and west and north and south. And how you can familiarize or how to bring the other people together in Turkey and this blue stream or blue uh, homeland narrative had to bring all the groups, even the opposition groups in, 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 in Turkey, uh, and to move forward. And it also contributes Turkey's security, naval security, maritime security uh, perspective as well. And this was the reason. But last couple of, let me say, months, you don't hear the, the word, in fact, within Turkey as well. And what happened to admirals, these are also related with Turkey's domestic politics, as I said. Uh, and for the government or the presidential administration, there is a kind of an expectation to have a kind of a success story after Syrian operations or what happened in, in Iraq uh, to fight against terrorism. What makes uh, the government very effective or assertive in, the, in, the, in its neighborhood and its regions was Blue Homeland. Then most probably what's happening in the Caucasus put uh, all those Blue Homeland related issues aside and Turkey has changed its direction towards EU and Greece for negotiations. For example, eight months ago or the, the, at the beginning of this year, it was unimaginable for many, uh, not only in Turkey, but in the region as well. Therefore, this has as a kind of a new invention to develop a new perspective for the, for the groups in Turkey. This is, this is the reason, but it, it, it is a kind of an unproductive uh, thing at the end. Thank you, Mitat. Uh, looking at the role of uh, international players uh, in, uh, in the area, there is a, uh, an interesting question on uh, Russia to uh, all the panelists. Uh, how do you see Russia's uh, interest and behaviors as both uh, a major producer and exporter of hydrocarbons and a power willing to play a relevant role uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean? would like to answer this question, maybe Gabi? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, obviously, uh, Russia has historically uh, been an important actor in the Eastern Mediterranean, continues to uh, be an important actor, both uh, due to its strategic uh, base of operations in Syria, its role in the Syrian civil, uh, civil war, its support uh, or, or uh, engagement with actors like Turkey, but also actors like Hezbollah and, uh, and it, the role that it's played in Libya. So um, Russia is a, a, is a constant, um, just the same way that the Eastern Mediterranean is Europe's backyard. Russia, at the very least, can try to make similar claims. Um, and of course, the Eastern Mediterranean um, for decades was an, uh, uh, a theater of American operations, which uh, I have no doubt that uh, actors in Russia are, are more, more than happy to fill the void um, as the United States slowly withdraws from the region. So I think that when it comes to Russia's engagement, there are two separate ways of, of looking at it. First, Russia uh, is not particularly threatened by uh, Eastern Mediterranean hydrocarbons, which comparatively do not match 
uh, its own uh, capacity, um, but it doesn't have any issue playing a small spoiler role, um, even though at this present moment, it seems like the actors of the Eastern Mediterranean can handle that on their own and they don't necessarily need all that much Russian interference. Um, but certainly it's in Russia's interest that there continue to be uh, outstanding disputes between Eastern Mediterranean actors and in particular between Turkey and the other actors of the region. Turkey as a member of NATO uh, and at least historically an important member uh, within the, the transatlantic alliance um, seems to be shifting in an independent or more independent direction. So long as that occurs and so long as Turkey's uh, issues with other Eastern Mediterranean states are not resolved, that serves and works to Russia's advantage. So um, certainly if you're looking to kind of contain Russia's influence, that's perhaps the most important place to start. But Russia is here and, and Russia is not going, and going away anytime soon. And uh, my expectation is that in the coming years, Russian companies are going to try to explore and exploit uh, offshore hydrocarbon resources, whether in the waters of Lebanon or in Syria, um, and so the Russian angle is going to uh, be ever present. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gabi. And uh, I would like to turn to, to Alessia as uh, Russia and uh, Egypt uh, were on, uh, on the same page, on the same side uh, in, uh, in Libya. So Alessia, from uh, your point of view, what's uh, Russia's role uh, in, uh, in the region? Um, yes, the, the role of Russia in uh, Libya has been and is uh, uh, really important, uh, especially I think uh, in this particular moment. But uh, also I think that uh, Libya is not really strategic for Russia, it's more static. And uh, for this reason I think that uh, he um, tried to avoid a direct confrontation with Turkey and the other side. Of course this remain a problem and Egypt uh, also have to deal with uh, if uh, it wants to diffuse tension in the country and create this sort of uh, appeasement with uh, Turkey or uh, is uh, this uh, uh, rapprochement, with this possible rapprochement. Um, also, I agree what, uh, with what uh, Gabriel stated about the role, the, the, the increasing role of Russia in the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe in the next future. But uh, also, I think that um, another time, if we look at the general context that is uh, underway in, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, so this sort of changing in alliance. Uh, maybe it's possible to uh, think about the uh, possibility of diffusing tension and uh, paving the way for a possible initiative to promote a more cooperative security architecture. In this case, I think that both uh, European Union and NATO should uh, have a more active role and uh, encourage uh, announcing the uh, their already existing program of engagement and cooperation, such as the Mediterranean Dialogue and the European Labour policies which suffered during the, the, the last decade uh, of a lack of interest, commitment and uh, of course implementation. And I think that the space left by this uh, uh, treatment of the United States uh, should uh, have been filled, should be filled by, of course, and the new uh, uh, America of Biden, uh, and uh, uh, of course by a new role that the EU and the NATO should, and uh, I think will uh, uh, will carry it out in the in the next future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alessia. We are uh, getting to to the end, almost to the end uh, to this uh, to this panel. But I would like to ask. Uh, uh, to all of you, uh, a question uh, from a, a European perspective. How do you see uh, the role of, uh, of the EU? What role for uh, uh, the EU from uh, the regional perspective, from the perspective of different regional, uh, regional countries? Who would like to, to answer first uh, the, this question? Mitat, Gabriel, Zenonas, yeah, yes. 
just a, first. <laughs> just very quickly <laughs> yeah um there's not much to say so i'll be quick anyway <laughs> i mean um we know that the eu has a fundamental problem uh, you know having a coherent um a foreign policy and the eastern mediterranean is not an exception actually the eastern mediterranean is one of the, of the most problematic areas for the eu given that they have this um uh, these two main problems that are now uh, blocking somehow um, decisions within the EU, uh, this triangle between the EU, Turkey, and what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean with, with Greece and Cyprus. So I believe that if the EU were to play a positive role in various ways, either by pressuring or incentivizing actors in the region to overcome their problems through a European framework, uh, that would definitely unlock um, uh, the dif different possibilities in the Eastern Mediterranean. But we have so far seen that there is a great difficulty in achieving that, because um, obviously there are various different interests within the EU um, that, by extension, block any um, united um, efforts um, to, you know, to, to accomplish one specific thing, and they tend to go different ways. Uh, so I'm I'm not very hopeful uh, about about how how effective the EU can be uh, in the area. Thank you, Zenonas. So no, not positive uh, about the role of the EU, but it's a uh, very realistic uh, your your position, of course. So uh, we get. We get to the end of uh, our panel. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, interventions, for this uh, uh, very uh, insightful and fruitful uh, discussion. Let me thank uh, uh, also all people uh, that uh, attended uh, uh, virtually this, uh, this panel. And last but not least, I, I would like to, to thank my, uh, my colleagues uh, Igor, uh, Beatrice and Erika for their uh, precious uh, support. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. See you, see you next time. See you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.